This episode is definitely not on a budget. So if that's your baseline for interest, just uh, close it right away. Peace. Today, we're having a field day at Petavision's facilities here in Vancouver. In case you landed here without a clue what's going on, Petavision is a leading designer and manufacturer of high-end cameras and lenses for the film and television industry. Established in 1953, essentially because of anamorphic lenses, Panavision has continuously pushed the technical innovation in the industry. Over the years, Panavision has worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, providing them with custom tools to bring their creative visions to life on the big screen. With a commitment to quality and innovation, Panavision continues to shape filmmaking with cutting-edge equipment and world-class customer service. For the record, we're filming this episode in a 37 to 85 millimeters short zoom which is by far the largest lens ever used in this channel. It's also technically priceless. One of the most unique things about Panavision's lenses is no one can buy them. Pretty early in the game, the company spearheaded by Robert Gottschall came to the conclusion that if they continued selling the equipment they made, they'd be out of business. So the decision was to own all the gear and exclusively rent it out. This decision also allowed Panavision to invest in continuously improving their products and developing new technology, as opposed to constantly work simply to fulfill inventory. Not selling the gear also means that their development doesn't have a price cap. There's no lens too expensive if you don't have to worry about selling it. Not having a price tag and being directly influential through the history of cinema puts Panavision in the elite of optics and cameras, and they certainly lean into that trait. When I first made a movie and actually found that we could have Panavision equipment, and that first day of filming when I looked through the Panavision piece to line up a shot, I really thought I'd, I'd, uh, I'd made it. Something that gave me a jolt of inspiration is how Panavision might be the only optics company that focuses solely on film. All other companies splinter off into scientific applications like Canon and Sony, the medical field like Zeiss, or into providing the military, such as engineer. By not diversifying into different industries, Petavision has to stay at the top of the game in film, offering unique customer service and shipping all across the globe to cater to all the projects they're renting to. I'm personally torn by all of this, because on the one hand, this whole operation is very impressive and amazing, and has provided gear for films that were greatly influential to all of our lives. On the other hand, that's as far as on a budget that I can imagine. So even though I am among anamorphic lenses that I know and understand, I also feel incredibly out of place. It's just something to think about. I hope that by far you guess that I'm not testing a bunch of Panavision anamorphics. There's no point in reviewing these lenses. Best I can do is try my hand at story time and pick apart some interesting bits and technical concepts along the way. Another important note to address is Panavision has come up with a variety of technological innovations in the film industry. I'll be focusing only on lenses. During the research for this episode, I found out that Godshock got into anamorphics so he could get a better field of view out of underwater housings. It's hard to miss the similarity to Henri Chrétien's motivation to expand the field of view for soldiers inside of French tanks during First World War. The first product offered by Panavision, designed by Robert Gottschalk and Walter Wallen, was the Super Panatar, a chunky anamorphic projection lens based on achromatic prism systems that delivered manually adjustable squeeze factor. It was cheaper than the cylindrical projection lenses in the market, and it allowed theaters to project anything from a spherical, no squeeze picture, to full-blown, two-time squeeze. The Super Panatar sold for $1,100 back in 1954. And for a moment, uh, I thought, hey, that's not so anti-budget. But then I looked up and 1100 bucks in 1954 equals the buying power of 12 grand in 2023. With the Super Panatars, Panavision made waves in the industry at a key time. The establishing of the anamorphic format and its processes. Shortly after Gottschalk and Walling were hired by MGM, to develop anamorphics for the MGM-65 format, almost interchangeably known as Ultra Panavision 70. These came to be the APO Panatars, and they had a squeeze factor of 1.25 times. At the inception of anamorphic lenses, Hollywood essentially worked with a prime-taking lens and an anamorphic adapter in front of it. 
in two assistants to pull focus simultaneously. The APO Panatars combined those two blocks into one lens with a single focus ring. They launched at $11,000 per lens and immediately sold out. Since this is one of the last times we'll talk about purchase prices, these lenses would sell for 120K today. After that came the Auto Panatars. These are the OG scopes. Also, the last lenses Panavision sold before changing to the rentals only protocol. They rely on cylindrical elements and are pretty chunky too. This is where we started to see Panavision's ultimate solution for anamorphics, the Cowder Rotating Astigmatizer. We're very early in the development of anamorphic lenses for film, and the early systems relied on adapters like many of us still do today. The issue is the squeeze factor changes from the marked two times to something less as you come in for a close-up. Those are the anamorphic mumps, and they still show up today in lenses that use synchrofocus. If you have no clue of what synchrofocus is, check out the anamorphic cookbook. Wallen and Gottschalk set out to banish mumps from Hollywood. By experimenting with additional cylindrical elements in the design, they managed to create a system in which the squeeze is stabilized by this other pair of low-powered cylinders. They move in conjunction with the lens's focus, ensuring that the squeeze factor of the lens won't change during a close-up. As a quick observation, the elements used in the counter-rotating astigmatizer also contribute to lens flares, and this diagonal line is a dead giveaway of both Panavision glass and this focus system. By looking at the lenses, especially the older ones such as the Auto Panatars, B, C, and even E series, you can see a weird protrusion in the lens body from the gearbox that controls the rotation of these extra elements. The counter-rotating astigmatizer alongside improvements in optical design have brought us to a point where Panavision's anamorphics breathe exclusively in the vertical axis. You can check out any other anamorphics, low or high budget, and you won't find similar performance. By 1968, we hit the third iteration with the C-Series. These are the ones that everyone's familiar with. Panavision C-Series lenses were used in so many classic anamorphic films that they're almost the core of what defines the anamorphic look. Here's how Panavision describes them on their website. Characterized by a gradual depth of field, predictable full field performance at all apertures, a pronounced anamorphic flare, and flattering bokeh, these lenses impart an organic feel that many cinematographers prefer over the often sterile look of many modern day optics. They were used extensively between 1968 all the way to the late 1980s. Panavision's E-Series came out in the 80s and it essentially improved the technical side of the C-Series with better optics, more modern coatings, and fewer aberrations, going for a clean anamorphic look that is not too sharp. All these lens sets are incredibly varied with anything between 8 and 12 different focal lengths. In 2007, we got the G-Series, which featured an even cleaner look with reduced veiling glare but still pleasing streaks. The G-Series is the peak of breathing control, where we really only see vertical change during rack focus. The first time we came by, we had an array of G-Series to look at, and the first thing I noticed was how small and light they were compared to what I'm used to in terms of city lenses, let alone cinema anamorphic lenses. Last, there's the T-Series, which deliver further improvement on top of the G-Series in a set with 12 focal lengths from 28 all the way up to 180mm. They're also a little faster with a maximum aperture of T2.3 versus T2.6 on the G-Series. All these lenses deliver two times squeeze and are designed for Super 35 film or sensor size. Yet, with the rise of larger sensors in filmmaking, both G-Series and T-Series can be expanded to cover large format cameras. Like all other Panavision lenses, they come in PV mount, and this is also where we see a bit of strategy from that rental-only policy. Panavision developed both cameras and lenses, so to push more product out or to encourage you to rent the best product, they made their own mount, meaning that productions that wanted to use their lenses would need to also rent their cameras. And what's the deal with the PV mount? Well, it's a little like a reverse PL mount. The locating pin is actually in the lens mount instead of the camera body. The body has a groove where the pin goes. The first time I showed up here to play, I was all excited thinking I'd be able to get something in my own camera and I was nothing but a fool. But I learned since then and today we could 
try to mount any Panavision glass onto this S1H, thanks to a PV adapter, but it turns out we still couldn't do it, not allowed by them, because Panavision lenses only rent out with Panavision cameras. I would go to Panavision, she tests different cameras, different lenses, and we ended up shooting on the DXL2 again. I love the large format, and I also, there's something that this DXL2 sensor does that other cameras don't do to the to the bokeh on anamorphic lenses, and I like the way the DXL2 rendered out of focus light. Panavision also does anamorphics, uh, sort of. Here's their anamorphic flare filter, which, like all flare filters, goes in front of good old spherical glass. These are incredibly popular with commercials that want great flares, but not the added costs of filming anamorphic. The number one thing you will notice about this flare filter, though, is it doesn't hurt bokeh. In fact, there's no flare lines in the filter itself, and like a lot of the gear we saw today, it's a bit chunky. The filter clamps onto 112mm fronts, and it's actually a piece of cylindrical glass. The fact that the people who are designing the lenses and, and making the lenses are there in the same building is unheard of. It doesn't, it doesn't happen anywhere else. Even though Panavision really took off thanks to their anamorphics, nowadays anamorphics are their special selection. The Primos are their most popular lenses. These spherical gems are used in countless top-tier productions from Hollywood to commercials. The blue line was one of the innovations offered by the Primos when they came out in 1989. So what's the deal with the blue line? If we look closer, we'll see that the fastest stops are also indicated in the same blue color. This means that when the lens is set at those stops, you should align your focus marks with the blue line. For example, if I'm 6 feet away and we're filming at T1.9, which is marked blue, we'll line up the 6 foot marking with the blue line. If we are to stop down to T4, then the 6 foot mark has to slide up and line up with the regular index mark. This is to account for a shift in focus that affects most lenses when used wide open, not just Panavision lenses. The appeal of the set is that you can have up to 14 focal lengths, from 10mm to 150mm, all of them with a maximum aperture of T1.8 or T1.9, consistent performance, and color matching results. When they came out, they were also the sharpest lenses ever made by Panavision, which netted them an Academy Technical Achievement Award the following year. The Primos went on to win a few more awards during the coming decade for their technical qualities and engineering. In 2014, we saw the arrival of the Primo 70s, designed for large format. The Primo 70 lenses come with a Super Panavision 70 mount, designed for the DXL2 camera sensor, and some of them have been made in such a way to include focus in iris motors inside the lenses, so they can be controlled remotely without the need for additional rigging. The SP70 mount has electronic contacts that can power the lens and also capture metadata to the recorded files, providing filmmakers with valuable information for post-production, especially in VFX-heavy projects where any and all info coming from the camera is incredibly valuable. Just thinking that these lenses have not only great optics and mechanics, but also all the electronics required to focus and control iris makes me think that there really isn't something that time and money can't make. While electronics are common for photography lenses, the possibility of controlling your budget-friendly cinema lenses without an external motor is almost unimaginable. Even if a lens maker managed to squeeze in all of the electronics into a budget-friendly cinema lens, each camera maker has its own proprietary focus and iris protocols, meaning that if these lenses are to work on different cameras, the development costs stack for all of the different operating systems. So for Petavision, it makes sense to develop their own cameras, their own protocols, and even unique lenses that go with all that simply because it's a closed system that doesn't need to worry about compatibility with other brands. And, of course, you can still forego all of the internal electronics and slap a focus motor on the lens anyway. I was starstruck by simply being here and overwhelmed with how much I learned in a single visit. I hope you had at least half the fun I had and learned something special today. Everyone has strong thoughts about Panavision, love, hate, so express them in the comments below. Thank you so much for hanging out. And I'll see you on the next one. Chit the Fahadings, out.